we are very happy he's here. Practically, we invited him with two reasons. The first one, to understand the cutting edge research in his field, which I was checking, of course, his website and his labs, and I saw that many topics are very much similar, and I said, okay, let's have him here and see how they think and how they see all this kind of research. And uh, the second reason is uh, to talk to him um, about uh, how he sees the future of clinical psychology, of evidence-based psychotherapy, because we are a clinical program, so we are very much interested to have a clear idea about <coughs> where to go and what are the next, let's say, challenges in the, in the next year. So we will talk about this maybe in this, this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much for coming. He had yesterday uh, a very interesting workshop. Most of you attended uh, the workshop. And today he will have a presentation which is more focused on the current research, right? In your lab, right? Oh, well, all of it was in my lab. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <please. laughs> thank you. Yeah, this is just some stuff that we're just finishing right now. Uh -huh. Um, I think this thing was made for members of the National Basketball Association. <laughs> <laughs> Kobe Bryant. Um, on the sort of a general topic of trauma and resilience, these are some studies that we're just uh, uh, finishing up right now. Um, just finished analyzing for the most part. And in uh, one case, it's, uh, it just appeared in print. But on the general topic of, of trauma and resilience, that's sort of a, a broad category. And I'll be focusing a bit on PTSD here, but also on uh, complicated grief uh, uh, as well. Whoops. Um, first of all, the, the, the whole issue of resilience in, in the trauma field, this has been sort of a, um, a little bit of a controversial topic. You wouldn't think it would be. Uh, it isn't now, but it had been for many years. Uh, when PTSD first appeared in the 19. 80 DSM-3. Uh, the idea here uh, was that anybody exposed to a really serious traumatic event would likely be at risk for developing post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, the notion that some people might be more or less at risk for developing PTSD, should they be exposed to trauma, was a very, very touchy subject. Many people in uh, my field, our field, uh, we're concerned that if we talked about risk factors for PTSD, that we're somehow blaming the victim for his plot. Uh, likewise, in, uh, using the sort of reverse term of resilience to traumatic stress, sort of implied, sort of implicitly, uh, uh, the, the notion that some people are more or less at risk, and therefore again arriving at the same conclusion. Now, of course, you could say, well, this is really a confusion of moral discourse and statistical discourse. Uh, to say that someone is more or less at elevated risk, say, for heart disease, if they, have, uh, uh, if they chose their parents wrong and inherited genes that give high cholesterol, for example, that's not really a problem for which they should be blamed. That's the same true with psychiatry as well. Nevertheless, it's been sort of a touchy subject. But today, I think now that PTSD is well ensconced it's in our nosology, it's, this is less of a touchy subject. And so now, uh, now that we realize that most people exposed to the DSM-3 Criterion A <coughs> events, the uh, Criterion A being the definition of a trauma in DSM-3 PTSD criteria, now that we realize that most people don't develop PTSD, we have to deal with risk variables and resilience variables. Having said that, the, um, what we, it's sort of interesting, uh, when, when people talk about resilience in the trauma field today, it really means different things. Uh, people use the word in different ways. Um, so for, boy, it's pop. There we go. Uh, for example, uh, some people, such as my friend George Bonanno at Columbia University, uh, he uses it in sort of a descriptive sense. So that is to say, if someone is exposed to some traumatic event and they show just a little uptick in symptoms, uh, which go away, he, he would call that the person is resilient, just sort of a descriptive sort of a term. It's one way in which it's used. Um, another way in which people will study this topic is identify certain variables that are statistically associated with diminished risk when someone's exposed to trauma, and, and then refer to uh, these as uh, the presence of protective factors. We might say someone, for example, uh, 
Well, we did studies with uh, cognitive ability and found out that higher cognitive ability was protective. And so then you could say, well, these people would theoretically be more likely to be resilient in virtue of these protective factors. Finally, <clears throat> we can ask the question, what the heck are people doing when they do not develop PTSD? If they're exposed to some traumatic events and they don't develop PTSD, what are the kind of coping methods they're using? And this, of course, ties into some of the themes that are going on right here. We're talking about uh, emotion regulation, for example. Uh, uh, so you can say, well, if someone, say, is, say, in higher cognitive ability, they don't develop PTSD, why? What are they doing differently than other people who do develop PTSD? And if we can identify what these factors are, can they be taught? Uh, and so, so this is where uh, some of the work on resilience has got sort of this, everybody's sort of holding their breath and hoping maybe we'll, we'll discover something. Now, uh, one study uh, that uh, we finished and just, um, uh, just appeared uh, was, was dealing with individuals who work for the United States Air Force as healthcare professionals. Uh, they're working in a place called Balad, Iraq. Um, it's 40 miles north of Baghdad. It's a two-tiered, it's sort of a military hospital. And the people working there are physicians, nurses, clinical psychologists, and so forth. Uh, Balad, uh, uh, now it's calmed down a bit, uh, but it was a very intense place to practice medicine. Because uh, it got hit by mortar attacks usually twice a day. And so you're performing surgery or you're doing CBT for acute stress disorder, and then some, somebody fires a mortar at you and you blows up part of the building. And so it was a very intense place to work. And we were wondering, we in this case, our, our research team here, Alan Peterson, incidentally, was a clinical psychologist who served in Balad. He's a colonel, uh, was a colonel, he's now retired, he's now a professor of psychiatry at uh, the University of Texas. But um, <clears throat> he was over there, and we were wondering whether we could uh, identify uh, uh, variables that might predict resilience in response to working in this stressful environment. Now, uh, one thing that uh, this type of research project can, can help us do is that we know that these folks going into the situation are likely to be exposed to some pretty serious stressors. And that enables us then to engage in a prospective longitudinal study. That is to say, we can take measures on these individuals, assessing candidate risk and resilience variables before they ever go to Iraq. Uh, and, uh, and then to see to what extent these things will predict depression, PTSD symptoms, and so forth. I say parenthetically here is that much of the work on risk and resilience, not all of it, but a lot of it, has been done uh, cross-sectionally. And so someone has already been exposed to traumatic events. They often have already developed or not developed PTSD. And you're looking at the correlates and saying, well, some of these probably existed, you know, present before exposure and things of that sort. But very few prospective studies. We did one some years ago with, with cognitive ability. We had the IQ scores of people before they went to Vietnam, for example, and then were able to predict. But those are hard to find. Now, in this study, uh, I'm just going to focus on one here. This was this repressor coping style. Uh, uh, Mike Isink, uh, George Bonanno, there's been a number of people who've, who've studied uh, the repressive coping style uh, as a possible predictor of resilience. And this is what we're doing in this particular group here. Uh, we had uh, 122 Air Force uh, healthcare professionals, as I said, deployed to Balad, Iraq. Uh, it's pre-deployment measures uh, of candidate uh, resilience variables. And our, our post-dependent, uh, post-deployment measures were five months uh, later, one month after the return to the United States. Uh, so we're interesting then, does repressive coping predict uh, lower PTSD? That, you know, that's what we're, what we're getting at here. Now, um, the measures that we had here, uh, we had the manifest anxiety scale, which has been a standard measure that figures in a lot of the repressive coping, the Marlowe Crown social desirability scale, uh, and um, the, our dependent measure, the post-traumatic stress disorder checklist, the PCLM, is probably the best measure we have right now uh, a self-report measure for use in big studies with lots of subjects that can be completed easily uh, of PTSD. Let's see. I think there's a pop here, right? 
Ah, okay. Yeah. Now, the traditional approach to studying repressive coping is a categorical one. You basically, you look at the subjects, you do a median split. This is how people have typically done it. And identified repressor, repressive copers is kind of a category, a type of person. Uh, that is to say, someone who scores low in anxiety and high in social desirability. So in other words, you score high in the so Marlowe's uh, crown social desirability. So you know, it taps attitudes such as, I have never disliked anyone in my life. <laughs> well, maybe. I always read the editorials every day in the paper. I'm a well-informed <laughs> citizen. You know, things like that. You know. Goes, oh, yeah, you know. So it's sort of like you know, putting a, a sort of good face forward. Uh, so people scoring high on social desirability, low on anxiety, a combination with the repressive focus. Now, uh, what we did, uh, we did a slightly different tack on this. We wanted to use this dimensional measure of repressive coping. The Marilyn Mendoli of social psychologists had, had hit upon her index of self-regulation of emotion. Uh, the dimensional measure of repressive coping said it combines the MAS, the anxiety scale, and the social desirability scale. Yielding a measure that goes from 0 to 33, and the higher a person is on this, the more they tend to employ this sort of repressive coping. That's kind of the idea. Now, um, so, there's higher pre-deployment scores then predict lower post-deployment PTSD symptoms. The answer, yes. Oh, the yes move. Oh. <laughs> well, there's some qualifications on it. That, this slide kind of goofed up on me for some reason. Oh, well, whatever. <laughs> At least the data are here. Uh, the, uh, 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 so first of all, what we found uh, is that, yeah, you know, you get lower, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, the, the higher the repressive coping, the lower the PTSD symptoms, so that, you know, that, that, you know, that comes through. Uh, but what we found here, however, is that uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, we took a, we sort of disaggregated this a little bit. We go, well, is this just repressive coping? Well, it turns out, it seems, that the lower pre-deployment anxiety appears to be driving this effect. So it's not so much just this repressive coping style, but it's something, unfortunately, a little bore, more boring message is, well, if you have low anxiety before you go in the service, you have low anxiety later. If you're nervous before, then you'll be nervous in the service, as they say. And uh, so this does, because this seems to be what's going on. In fact, the correlations between the components to get the MAS is actually 0.38. Uh, the SDS is 0.02. Uh, we also looked at the few cases of PTSD. One of the, one of the good things about this, we had 4% of the cases had presumptive post-traumatic stress disorder, and this was from the rocket attacks and things like that. Uh, incidentally, um, uh, the, the, the situation now in military medicine, even since the, not only since the Vietnam War, at least in the United States, but also since the Persian Gulf War of 1991, uh, the medical care has gotten, the battlefield surgery has gotten so good uh, that a lot of people who would have died before are saved. That's the good news. The bad news is that they have a lot of very serious mutilating injuries, losses of limbs and things that have caused death before uh, actually people survived with this. So the people practicing medicine in these situations today see an awful lot of very gruesome stuff. They save a lot of lives. Uh, but it turns out that the uh, the, the gruesome aspects is, are, is not what's driving the PTSD in these folks. The, the, the healthcare professionals are, are pretty well prepared for this. And they do a really good job. So we're getting the PTSD. It's from things like the rocket attacks uh, uh, on these folks. Um, and we, we found basically the same sort of pattern again, where we get, uh, sure, we get to, uh, 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 the uh, higher of repressive coping and no PTSD versus not. But again, it's being driven by the um, uh, by the anxiety scales. Uh, it's not being driven by repressive coping. So the prospective data then suggests that the seemingly protective effects of repressive coping may be attributable simply to lower pre-trauma anxiety. So this is kind of a mundane sort of conclusion, but well, that's what the data show. The next study I want to present is actually dealing with a bit of a mystery here. A bit of a mystery that um, uh, that requires a little bit of, just a little background to unravel first. In DSM-3, uh, something that qualified as a traumatic stressor, 
uh, were, uh, involved direct exposure to trauma, right? And usually life threat. That was the idea, right? Uh, and canonical traumatic stressors, the, the typical sorts of things that were deemed capable of producing the profile of PTSD symptoms were things such as combat, rape, natural disasters, and torture, things of this sort. There was sort of an implicit assumption that there's a category of events, traumatic stressors, that are qualitatively distinct from the ups and downs and stressors of everyday life. And that only these possess the pathogenic capacity to produce the profile of PTSD symptoms. That was the assumption. That was the assumption. But only canonical stressors have this capacity to produce PTSD. But of course, you can't legislate such things like that. That's an assumption, and indeed, it is an empirical one. But since then, we've seen kind of a conceptual bracket creep in our definition of trauma. It's been driven for, I think, good reasons. Uh, but nevertheless, it's leading to a puzzle that I, I hope this study can partly address. In DSM-4, as I mentioned yesterday in the presentation, I was on the DSM-4 PTSD committee, so I am partly responsible, but only one-twelfth responsible for some of these, I think, uh, changes that have caused some complications here. Under DSM-4, direct exposure to trauma, of course, still qualifies. We also have personally witnessing a trauma and being confronted with information about a threat to another person. Now, you think that, well, if you look at the DSM-4 PTSD criteria, you think a bunch of lawyers wrote the criteria instead of a bunch of shrinks. <laughs> you know, it's all this legalistic jargon, you know, being confronted with it. Well, uh, but what, the, what was driving this? Uh, let me just give you an example from some one of our DSM-4 PTSD committee meetings. Phil Sy, one of the members of the group, clinical psychologist, a Lebanese-American guy, who was living in Beirut in the 1980s. Beautiful Beirut was kind of a hot spot back then, ripped apart by internecine conflict and so forth. And um, when his house finally got blown up, he figured he was going to move back to the United States. But before that happened, he was treating children in Beirut who'd been exposed to all kinds of terrible events. But what Phil, he was doing, uh, doing expo, in vivo, uh, excuse me, imaginal exposure therapy, treating these kids with behavior therapy and having pretty good responses. But he encountered some kids that didn't quite fit our picture of traumatic exposure. Uh, so, uh, typical cases, you might have this 11 year old girl, for example. You know, she learns that her uncle has vanished. He's disappeared. They don't know what's happened to him. And then there's this knock on the door at night. Suddenly some guy comes to the door and the parents go to the door. The little girl's listening. And they say, we found him, meaning her uncle. He'd been kidnapped by militia, tortured, and killed. And this little girl's hearing all this horrible stuff. Did it happen to her? No. Did she witness it? No. But she was confronted with information about a threat to another person, in this case her beloved uncle. And so Phil then would say these kids would start having nightmares. They, they, they generate imagery consistent with the stories that they've heard, they're having flashbacks, all those sorts of things. He says, they got PTSD, what do I do with them? He, he acted as if, quote unquote, they met PTSD. They didn't qualify for the disorder, of course, at the time, because they did not meet criterion A. Uh, and so here we are in the PTSD community. So what do we do with these people? What do we do with these folks? And, and so, so we sort of expanded this concept of what it means to be exposed to a traumatic event, to include these things. Now, mind you, what we had in mind were cases like Phil size young patients, where you know the person. But then what happens is this. Not the, not the attacks themselves but the televised coverage of them. In the week after, in the days after the 9-11 attacks, I get these phone calls from journalists and 
And they would say, you know, Professor McNally, you were on the DSM committee, blah, 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 the PTSD and whatnot. Uh, now, it says there, it says there right here that uh, if you are confronted with a threat to other people, to their bodily integrity, that they could qualify for PTSD if they experience helplessness or horror. And I go, yes. And they go, well, how about somebody living in a farm in Iowa who's watching CNN and gets horrified? Doesn't that qualify? And I go, well, that's not exactly what we had in mind. The television could cause this, per se. But they're going, well, you guys wrote this, right? <laughs> and lo and behold, Bill Schlanger, publishing in the Journal of the American Medical Association, reports that 4% of American citizens living far from the scenes of the attacks themselves and not knowing people they're directly involved develop PTSD. So now we have this interesting situation of people apparently developing PTSD from television. What is going on? In fact, now, under DSM-4, yes, you can thank me partly for this, <laughs> you no longer have to be ex at present at the scene of the trauma to be a trauma survivor. The people who witnessed these attacks on CNN are just as much a PTSD candidate qualifying potentially for the disorder as those folks who managed to get out of the towers before they collapsed. So we've got this expansion of the concept of trauma in DSM-4. Uh, we also now, other people said, well, gosh, maybe we could see whether other types of events also can produce PTSD. Again, we can't legislate this, right? So we can have to test it. We have had some very interesting things. Uh, a paper published in Clinical Psychology Review recent, not, uh, a couple years ago showed that the uncomplicated birth of a healthy baby can produce PTSD in some women. The birth of one's child, an occasion for joy? Well, possibly PTSD. Now, some members of the audience might say, yeah, you're a guy, right? Yeah, you've never ever had birth to anybody. <laughs> well, all right, fair enough. Nevertheless, uh, this is, you know, not what people are typically thinking of here. It's not a complicated birth. It's not a life thing. Then we also have, famous case in Michigan, exposure to obnoxious jokes at work. Famous lawsuit, from Daimler Chrysler, the, uh, Chrysler the automaker. They were, they were sued for a case of uh, someone who had developed PTSD from hearing these obnoxious sort of sexual innuendo, innuendo jokes at work. You might think, for, those must have been very bad jokes. <laughs> Well, present to PTSD, and, and it was a $100 million lawsuit. The, the jury and the court said that was too much, so they gave the person $10 million. Now, I'm not, I'm not d disputing you know, the money or, 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 or that sort of a thing, but I, I'm saying, uh, what is the syndrome that arose in the individual who was awarded this thing? Is that PTSD? What's going on? And finally, we also have extraction of a wisdom tooth. <laughs> I've, I've lost four of mine. <laughs> You know, but I, I, it was not exactly fun. I've had more fun in my life than having those things pulled out and the whole face swollen for you. But post-traumatic stress disorder? My first thought when I read this paper was, oh my God, the liability insurance of America's dentists are going to go way up. <laughs> I'm suing you for reducing. So what should we make of these findings? What should we make of it? What is going on? There's several possibilities. One is that people exposed to non-canonical stressors, and I think those qualify as non-canonical, um, who do meet criteria for PTSD, so they say yes, yes, they answer the questions positively, but they don't really have PTSD. You know, that they are somehow misunderstanding the meaning of the questions. Uh, that, that when we talk about flashbacks or emotional numbing, they, they, they're, they're, they, they're just misunderstanding. So they don't really have PTSD. That's one possibility. Don't understand the questions. But it's also another possibility, is that they actually do have post-traumatic stress disorder, but that there's some kind of a, a background foreground inversion going on here. That is to say, our implicit model of post-traumatic stress disorder is that the stressor, or the memory of the stressor, to be more precise, the stressor bears the causal burden of producing the syndrome. Yes, we now acknowledge that there are resilience variables and risk factors involved, but they're always in the background. 
right? They're always in the background because it's the stressor that carries the causal burden. But maybe what's happening in these cases is that people really do have PTSD, but this is an inversion where the risk factors move into the causal foreground and as the trauma itself recedes into the causal background, sort of inverting the implicit model of PTSD, but nevertheless producing the syndrome. If we have sort of a diathesis stress kind of a, a meta theory here, then maybe what's going on is that the diathesis is driving the effect. So, stress, the risk factors may be moving into the background. So what this would imply then is that maybe these risk factors are playing a larger role in causing PTSD for victims exposed to less severe stressors relative to victims exposed to more severe stressors. Maybe that is what's going on. Maybe that's the solution to this mystery, this puzzle. Uh, uh, so what we decided to do, Don Ravenau and I, one of my graduate students, we were uh, uh, studying um, uh, in a recent wave of uh, sexual abuse survivors. This is a different cohort than the ones I was talking about yesterday. We are looking at risk and resilience variables. And we had 102 women we recruited from the community from the Boston, Cambridge area who reported a history of childhood sexual abuse, CSA. And we, we sort of developed a severity measure here. Now, all of these people are above the threshold for criterion A, okay? So I'm not talking about the wisdom tooth and those. Nevertheless, you can sort of grade the severity and in sort of a crude, you know, coarse grain way, in such a way that some people have had worse sexual abuse experiences, some sort of in the middle, and some less severe. And what we did here, based upon previous research, we figured, well, there's a dose response idea, right? That is to say, if you've had more than one episode, that's usually, usually worse than only one episode. And if the perpetrator is a member of your core family, that is worse than if it's a stranger, for example. And so we just had this sort of a simple coding scheme that um, yielded three groups of subjects, uh, all of whom are above the criterion A, but in terms of severity. We had a low severity group, a medium severity group, and a high severity group. Let's broke it out that way. Our measures here uh, were the, uh, the post-traumatic checklist, the PCL, the civilian version of this, the Beck Depression Inventory, the, uh, and uh, we also uh, gave the Shipley Institute of Living. This is a measure of cognitive ability. We've had studied this, like I said before, with the Vietnam veterans. Uh, Naomi Breslau, a colleague of mine, epidemiologist, has done this with kids uh, in Michigan, that higher cognitive ability is protective and so forth. Now, so our question then is, if there is a background foregone inversion going on, then this raises the question, is the effect size, the association, the effect size for the relation between the risk factor, in this case, lower IQ, and PTSD, we also measured depression, and PTSD symptoms greater for the low severity group than for the medium and high severity groups. In other words, that if you've had a less severe abuse, like it's a single episode by a stranger, a fondling or something, versus somebody who's repeatedly assaulted by one's stepfather, then that uh, you might find a greater, that the IQ variable will play a bigger role for the lower severity. That was the idea. The results, uh, first of all, we did find a dose response effect for presumptive categorical PTSD. In other words, as coarse grained as our measure of severity was, it was associated with uh, differential PTSD rates. So the low severity 27, medium 33, high severity 62. Now, uh, we also replicated our previous effects with the connection between IQ and PTSD symptoms and also with uh, depression. The higher the IQ, the lower the symptoms. Now, okay, so does the strength of association, the effect size, between lower intelligence and greater PTSD symptoms vary as a function of the stressor severity? Yes, to some extent. <laughs> So it's one, I tell you, we've got, this could be sort of a very strange talk, because all, every, well, not true, the, the last study, we actually got some of our hypotheses right, you know, we got several of them, it's, uh, the next study, it's even, even more surprising, but stay tuned. So to some extent, we're actually getting, we're getting something uh, consistent with this. So for example, in the low severity group, 
uh, we do in fact find that the higher the IQ, the lower the PTSD. A fairly nice effect size, negative 0.43. Okay. Uh, so far, so good. And then when we go to the medium severity, the effect size drops. And so this is exactly what we're, we'd be predicting here, right? So, so the magnitude of the effect size, uh, it just doesn't matter as much when you are dealing with more severity. And then we go to the third group. And well, it's, it sort of pops up again. All right. Uh, so yeah, it's, it, it's kind of consistent, but not fully so. Um, and then we also ask the question, does caseness, you know, whether or not you have PTSD versus not, uh, of, um, does it hold for that as well as, well as in terms of the severity? And, uh, uh, and again, we find that the same effect. We get negative 6.8 for low severity. The medium severity, we get a correlation. Actually, this is even, uh, the effect size here is even smaller than some of the ones I presented yesterday, 0 0.001, negative. Uh, so it virtually goes away. It just doesn't matter. High severity group, it pops up a little bit again. So they're not getting a completely consistent picture. And these are fairly small sample sizes. So, but, but what we're trying to do is at least get an idea of what's going on in these cases. Now, we also find a similar pattern for depression symptoms. Once again, uh, negative 6.1, negative 0.03, uh, and then boop, pops up again. Okay? Well, at least we're consistent. Um, now, of course, you ask the question, are the effect size significantly different from one another? I mean, um, and uh, it was for a couple of the variables. IQ and depression symptoms, uh, lower severity uh, being greater for medium severity, and IQ um, and uh, PTSD caseness. Okay? Uh, so there, so the one question you have is, well, all right, numerically the correlations, the effect sizes are changing, but are they significantly different? They were in a couple of cases. So here's... Uh, so the conclusions here, what we are trying to do in this first study is test this hypothesis about background foreground inversion, which weirdly enough, is no one's ever tested, possibly because it seems so self-evidently true. Uh, but it may not be. We have some evidence for this, but it's not fully consistent. Well, so what we're hoping to do is maybe to stimulate some research on this, because this hypothesis can be attacked in a number of different ways. Um, for example, uh, we might uh, want to test whether the effect size differ for other risk factors. Uh, 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 higher neuroticism is a risk factor. Lower neuroticism is a protective factor. Uh, does, that fun does the effect size for that vary as a function of stress or severity? Does it happen for different stressors? Uh, the one study, actually dating from the 1970s, uh, before PTSD actually, uh, that, that, uh, that was done by John Helzer, was dealing with combat veterans in v uh, Vietnam. He looked at childhood predictors, and he found out that if you had misconduct problems as a child and so forth, that predicted um, depression regardless of how much combat you had. So it didn't seem to matter. Uh, but so we really don't know, and he wasn't studying PTSD. Uh, does it occur across stressors? We know that rape is by far the most traumatic event when it comes to producing PTSD relative to, say, fender benders, minor car accidents. Well, that would seem to imply, then, th that uh, the effect size for risk factors would be a lot smaller for rape victims than for car accident victims. I don't know. Uh, but uh, this might explain why someone might be genuinely having PTSD despite not being exposed to genuinely traumatic stressors or to milder traumatic stressors. The next. Uh, 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 a project that I want to uh, present, when we get uh, hypotheses going exactly, data going exactly opposite to our hypotheses to sort of pre uh, preview things a bit here. Um, what well, was a genomic study? Uh, we were uh, genotyping these subjects because we're also interested in uh, the serotonin transporter alleles as possible predictors of risk and resilience among our childhood sexual abuse survivors. Um, as many of you know, Avshalom Caspi. I uh, had reported some years ago uh, that carriers of the uh, two short alleles and the, uh, uh, for the serotonin transporter gene were at elevated risk. In fact, actually carriers of one were as well, for that matter, uh, for depression if they were exposed to stressful life events. Uh, so we are wondering well, whether this holds up with our CSA survivors as well. Uh, we, uh, uh, <coughs> So does psychological distress in adults reporting histories of childhood sexual abuse vary as a function of their genotype? 
That's the, it's a, the basic kind of a question we're bringing into the trauma field here. Um, as I just mentioned, uh, the, the, uh, the general approach people have been using is, is between the long alleles and the short alleles. They're a little physically different. They're physically longer. The longer ones express more of the gene than do the shorter ones. There's actually, last time I looked, there's nine versions of this gene, actually. Most of them are very, very, very infrequent. Um, but there uh, is one that's, that's less uh, infrequent. Um, uh, it's actually a long version that expresses like a short one. Okay, and so nowadays people do triallelic genotyping. Basically what you do, we, we call it the spit kits. You know, they appear to spit in the kit and then they extract the DNA and genotype, very easy to do. Um, and so what we did here is we did triallelic genotyping uh, so we could code for the longer gene that is in effect a, an imposter. It looks long, expresses short. And so the way we sort of uh, organized our data set uh, with the CSA survivors, uh, we had one group that are sort of the high expression groups. So they, were, uh, they are uh, uh, the, the two long alleles, uh, the traditional ones that express the gene uh, to a um, great extent. And the low expression ones, they're either short, short, or the imposter long, so to speak. So to speak, and then the uh, heterozygous uh, subjects with one long and one short. Incidentally, nobody really knows whether the short allele is, uh, I'm calling them high, moderate, and low. Uh, that sort of presupposes here uh, that there's an additive effect as opposed to a dominance effect. Uh, additive effect would be, you know, the more short alleles you have, the less expression you get. All right. Uh, by contrast, uh, there's some evidence that suggests that the short allele is simply dominant that if you've got one of them, you're kind of stuck. You know, in terms of you're going to be expressing at a low, low degree, one or two, doesn't matter. Uh, Caspi found that, even though if you did look at his data, it looks as if it's, it's a dose-response effect, uh, which would be an additive assumption. So we, we just tested both ways here. Um, we had uh, um, uh, good genotypes from, from 92 of the subjects that were recruited here. And the way it broke out, we had 18 high expressions, uh, 49 moderate uh, and 25 low expressions, kind of what you'd expect, Artie Weinberg. Um, we had the uh, measures here, the PCL, BDI, I, I mentioned those earlier. Uh, and we also studied uh, dissociative experiences and also the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. Um, we used contrast analysis, so we, we had predictions based on CASPI on, on how this should go, uh, testing both an additive, um, a dose response assumption and the dominance one. So, the question then is, do carriers of two low expressing alleles exhibit more psychiatric distress than do carriers of one low expressing allele who exhibit more distress than do carriers of two high expressing alleles? That is a mouthful, isn't it? That's a long hypothesis, it really is. It took a, probably a full minute for me to spit that one out. Uh, but that, of course, is the, uh, you know, that's the additivity assumption, right? And we also did it with the dominance where we would group the short expressors together. And the answer is no. Much to our surprise. So we look at the PTSD symptoms here. You see uh, we've got the low, moderate, and high. And uh, well, first of all, there's nothing going on. There's simply no difference. It just doesn't matter uh, when it comes to PTSD symptoms with our subjects here. Uh, and then things get stranger. Self-esteem, it's going backwards. There we go again. My first thought, well, when the data start coming out, like they say, call Steve and Don and Jordan Smolder, my psychiatric genetic colleagues, I says, uh, we didn't code these guys wrong. Did, are you sure you got this right? <laughs> oh, no, we double-checked everything. And we thought maybe they flipped the genotypes, right? No. The data coming out backwards. So. Um, the, the low expressing, the supposedly vulnerable genotype, they've got the highest self-esteem. The so-called resilient one, the, the lowest. Dissociative symptoms, same problem. Uh, the, res the, the, the theoretically resilient genotype, they're the most dissociative. And then we think, oh, maybe it's just depression. Right? Caspi is studying depression, really, in the PTSD. Are they significant? Hmm? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, well, for the different contrasts, so, so for example, you know, the, uh, this one is uh, significant uh, on both the contrast for dominance and for uh, um, 
additivity. This was for additive uh, for the uh, dominance, not additivity. Okay, um, but but uh, and then for de but we're seeing the same thing for depression. And so we got the the so-called resilient, one of the most depressed. So this is, results are completely the opposite of what Caspi's getting. We go. What is going on here? Well, in our in our research. We were interested in studying risk and resilience among the adult survivors of childhood <laughs> sexual abuse. And we take all comers. In the Boston area, it's very ethnically and racially diverse. We've got people from all over the place there. We've got, and so we have African Americans, we've got people from Africa who've immigrated and so forth. And we had what looks like racial stratification effects. Uh, what this is referring to, this is a, a thing that can pop up in some of these genomic studies. Um, for example, the long, long genotype is about twice as common in subjects of African ancestry than of subjects of European ancestry, you know, <clears throat> 60, 30. Now, if the AA subjects, African American subjects, score higher than the EA, European American subjects, on psychiatric measures, then the long, long genotype per se may not be a high risk one. And so I'm uh, looking at this, I said, well, uh, I'm sort of holding my breath here and say, oh boy, you know, because you could have this artifactual confound, right? So in other words, what we find here, however, I, so I looked at just the long, long genotypes, the black and white subjects, just comparing those two, and sure enough, not statistically significant, but strong trends, the numbers are kind of small, so, you know, the significance isn't the issue here, but uh, the African-American subjects were scoring higher on the psychiatric measures. So what might be going on is that these subjects have been exposed to more traumatic events, they're scoring higher in the psychiatric sim symptoms, and despite the fact that they're the long, long genotype, we're getting these sorts of results. So we figure maybe that's what's driving the effect, right? And so we then remove those subjects, our ends go down, but we want to at least look at the pattern of results. Does it change? Well, not that much. Not that much. Uh, so so uh, yeah. there are no, there's, there's no differences here. So the statistics are, the subjects are too small even to do the stats on We're just looking at the numbers. So you see a little bit of a hint uh, of the theoretically high risk would be a little bit higher uh, on the low, but not the other ones, huh? Uh, Self-esteem, nope, that's still there, you know? Whether they're European, Ancestry, it just, again, and so that's not accounting for this. Uh, dissociative symptoms, again, there's no differences here. Uh, and, uh, and depression, it's not going away. Uh, the same pattern. It, it's moderating a little bit. It's not significant anymore. But we're still getting results that are running backwards. I mean, what is going on? And just as we're writing up this study, uh, well, first, the conclusion here. So the allegedly resilient genotype, the high expressors, tends to have worse outcome than does the allegedly vulnerable genotype. So we're getting results in the opposite direction. We take out the white subjects, uh, I mean the black subjects, it doesn't go away. An article appears in the British Journal of Psychiatry that just blew me away. I don't know these guys. They were doing this study in the North Island of New Zealand. You know, the Caspi went down to the South Island, Dunedin, to do a study. I don't know, what's with these New Zealanders? They, 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 they start these 30-year longitudinal studies of their kids, and they forget about them, come back 30 years later and say, hey, look, look at the data. And, and so there's another study in New Zealand on the North Island, Christchurch. And Ferguson's studying this. And they, they, they had all these subjects, they did all these regression models. Talk about doing multiple statistical tests. They went totally berserk. They found no evidence for the SS carriers to have more psychiatric symptoms than carriers of the long allele. I mean, nothing. And then, one of the rare statistically significant effects, you say, well, yeah, they did a million tests, I'm good for by chance alone, I know. But, interestingly enough, carriers of the two long alleles reported more depressive symptoms than did heterozygous subjects who in turn reported more depressive symptoms and carriers of the two short alleles. So they got the same, basically the same pattern results with sexual abuse. Very interesting. Now, I don't know what's going on in New Zealand. I mean, the North Island says one thing, the South Island says the other. 
almost everybody there, it seems to me, when I've been down there, they're all from descendants from Scotland. I mean, they're a very homogeneous group. There are, there's very few Maori people in this, mainly Scottish uh, people. Uh, I don't, so it's not a racial stratification, so they're getting exactly the, the, the same opposite results. So is there something with the sexual reason? I don't know. But um, uh, so that's a, a, a strange study number two. Now, finally, I'm going to show some, there were finally some of our hypotheses were right. Boy, I tell you, we just keep getting it backwards. Can't guess anything right. But this one here is a little more. And this is the complicated grief study. Somebody back in the back row is starting to study this stuff. Uh, Don and I, uh, we were uh, launched a study on autobiographical memory, envisioning the future in complicated grief after spousal bereavement. Now, uh, we've done a, a number of studies on autobiographical memory in uh, my lab. I described one yesterday, but we had done some years ago with PTSD. Um, and we've done some with obsessive compulsive disorder. And we moved on here with a complicated grief uh, uh, for some special reasons. Incidentally, this uh, syndrome is sort of a, a, a proposed diagnosis for the DSM-5, uh, uh, as uh, many of you may know. And uh, Kathy Shear, uh, a Columbia University psychiatrist there, has been, uh, and uh, Holly Priggerson at Harvard Medical School, there's been a couple people who have been doing a lot of work on it and saying that there's a syndrome of complicated grief that is really different from normal bereavement. Particularly, certain cardinal symptoms are this kind of a distressed yearning uh, for the person who is passed away. Or waves of negative emotion that hits the person, a sense of hopelessness of a future that looks blank. Uh, a sense of lost identity. Now that my wife or husband has died, a part of me is missing. Okay, and so it's a very sort of different phenomenology uh, than ordinary grief, and one that is associated with uh, other mental health problems and also physical distress as well, probably taxing the immune system, rendering people more vulnerable to disease. Now. Um, uh, there had been some research on uh, the autobiographical memory test. Uh, Mark Williams, as I mentioned yesterday, is the one who sort of stumbled upon this, that if you give people a simple Q word and ask them to retrieve a specific memory from their life, an event that happened on a period no longer than a day, people with major depression have difficulty performing this task. Uh, we found with Vietnam veterans and people with PTSD also have trouble with this, as have other people who also studied PTSD. It's also showing up in complicated grief. Um, essentially what happens in this task is that the older general memory phenomenon, is, as I mentioned yesterday, I'll repeat this for those people who weren't there yesterday, um, is that um, uh, people with depression, PTSD, and complicated grief will tend to produce a memory that's a, a categorical memory. Uh, I'm always happy when I'm playing tennis. They'll have a hard time recalling a specific episode uh, when they were playing tennis and felt happy. Or an extended memory. They'll refer to a whole period in their life rather than a specific episode. A whole period in their life lasting longer, far longer than a day. By contrast, most people have a pretty easy time as they can recall specific memory lasting no longer than a day. Uh, so the uh, but we have a bit of a paradox here. On the one hand, uh, PTSD patients, for example, have difficulty retrieving specific memories. On the other hand, they have no difficulty experiencing involuntary recollections of traumatic memories. So you get this sort of a weird paradox. So it's not, uh, um, it's not a general phenomenon, no, no pun intended here, but, but it's, it's for non-traumatic material that they show this deficit. The traumatic material, they recall all too well. So the memories of trauma are specific and distressing. So what is going on here? This incidentally also holds for complicated uh, grief, as uh, Paul Boland and colleagues at Utrecht have sort of found. One possibility is that prepotent intrusive memories of the deceased, the things that sort of come back to the person all of the time, uh, may make it difficult for subjects with complicated memory to retrieve specific memories, that you get sort of a working memory uh, being sort of eaten up in this process in such a way that this is getting in the way. Perhaps these intrusive memories then interfere with the normal retrieval process. These are normal also envisioning of the future, difficulty imagining what the future is like. There's been some 
predictions of that. The idea here is that when you are asked to envision the future, prospection, as Dan Schachter and Dan Gilbert, uh, uh, to, to my departmental colleagues, one a social psychologist, one a cognitive psychologist have studied this, Schachter dealing with the brain, uh, Dan dealing uh, in emo emotional forecasting and so forth, seeing, envisioning the future. Um, these rely on the same autobiographical memory database. So the same mechanisms that help you retrieve specific memories are involved in constructing them and seeing one's future. Now, um, if difficulty then, uh, inhibiting prepotent memories involving the deceased mediates difficulties, uh, subjects with complicated grief have in remembering the past and envisioning the future, and maybe working memory capacity may moderate this process. That might affect this to some degree. The people with greater working memory capacity might be able to do a better job of this. Um, now, in this study, our subjects, we recruited them also for the community, uh, involved spousal bereavement. Uh, it actually was a fairly short period, so it had to be one to three years post-bereavement. Um, we had two groups of subjects. We had those with the complicated grief and those with uncomplicated grief, just, if you will, normal or healthy subjects. Now, relative to subjects with uncomplicated bereavement, will subjects with complicated grief exhibit difficulty retrieving specific autobiographical memories not involving the deceased, and envisioning specific future events not involving the deceased? So what we did here, we gave them the cue words, okay? And so it's either going to be about a memory from the past or about envisioning some event in the future. But there's a catch. For some trials, they're asked to retrieve a specific memory from the past that involved their dead spouse. On other trials, a specific memory from their past that did not involve their dead spouse. Likewise, about envisioning the future, trying to imagine an event in the future that could, could have happened that involved your spouse, should your spouse have lived. Or imagining an event in the future that does not involve your spouse. So we're trying to separate these two different things here. So, to summarize, the autobiographical memory component was either with the deceased or without. The prospection task, envisioning the future, with the deceased or without the deceased. Now, we also measured uh, uh, working memory capacity, the operation span task, where it involves uh, the person doing a simple, uh, they, they, don't, uh, they, they read a simple uh, arithmetic uh, problem and answer yes or no if it's correct or incorrect. And, and then, they, uh, uh, then, the, then a word follows, uh, they say the word out loud, etc., and they have to do a number of these, and then they have to remember all the words, write them all down in the order they occurred. That's a measure of working memory capacity. We also measured this as well. And this is what we found. Okay, in this graph here, uh, we see the, um, uh, the complicated grief subjects are in the black bar. The gray bar are the uncomplicated um, uh, grief, or the control subjects, in effect. And, uh, uh, and when we take a look at the autobiographical uh, memory uh, task, we're looking at the, the proportion specific, okay? So we're, we're, we're applying the specific memories here. When it comes to retrieving a specific memory from your past involving the spouse, there's absolutely no evidence of a deficit. You know, these guys are just fine, the complicated grief subjects. So they can do this. And so this is fully consistent with the fact that these things might be partly intrusive as well. Then we ask them to retrieve a specific memory from their past without it. And that's when we start to see the evidence of the overgeneral memory phenomenon. It's harder for them to pull that off. Harder for this to pull. So this partly explains this apparent paradox of intrusive specific memories and the overgeneral memory phenomenon. It depends about whether it's, if you will, trauma related, or in this case, uh, spouse related. Now, when it comes to um, envisioning uh, the, the future, what happens here is the complicated grief subjects actually can envision the future quite well, but with their spouse. Unfortunately, the spouse is dead. When it comes to envisioning the future without the spouse, they're drawing a blank. 
And so what seems to be going on here is that when you start dealing with the past and especially the future, and you split the task up, the prospection task of spouse and not spouse, you wind up seeing what appear to be the cognitive bases for two of the symptoms of cognitive grief. One is the yearning one. Because here you have subjects with complicated grief. When it comes to imagining uh, going on a vacation that, that you might have had with your spouse next uh, summer, they can envision that very well. It's very vivid for them. And there's that yearning because they know darn well that the spouse is no longer alive. At the same time, the sense of a blank future of hopelessness, imagining your future, they have a hard time doing that without their spouse. And so this seems, and this also, of course, resolves this paradox of intrusive specificity combined with the overgeneral memory. It seems to be the cognitive basis of what's going on with these guys, at least from these data. Oops. Okay, um, then we looked at the uh, uh, interaction between the, um, the, the uh, uh, complicated grief scores just across the subjects, the CGI severity here, and um, the autobiographical memory task about the past uh, uh, without, this, uh, you know, without this spouse here. And we find that the uh, high working memory capacity makes it a little bit easier here, that you start seeing the deficits here uh, over general memory with subjects with a lower working memory capacity when it comes to remembering the past. Uh, so we get some, uh, we get some sort of a, a, a effect here of working memory capacity that uh, doing it with the past, this makes a difference. With the future, it uh, doesn't seem to, uh, it, it's, it's a general effect over, across the board that the more severe your, your symptoms are, uh, the harder you have doing this. And there's not much in the way going on here about the working memory uh, capacity. Uh, at all. <coughs> but anyway, just to wrap this up then, well, uh, with this particular study, uh, when you start splitting up memory and prospection, depending upon whether it's quote unquote trauma relevant or not, deceased spouse relevant or not, suddenly the paradox resolves. You finally understand what the heck seems to be going on, first of all. And second, uh, that the yearning symptoms, the ability to envision the future without the deceased, yet knowing that it can't happen, is captured by this uh, sort of task. Now, um, this raises an interesting possibility. As many of you know, because I know you're working on attention training and tasks like this, there's a lot of work on cognitive bias modification. And one possibility that's raised by this basic experimental work is, is it possible, can we do for lack of a better word, simulation training uh, in such a way with complicated grief subjects. Because one of the things is the ability to envision a future without the spouse. They have a hard time doing that. Is there possibility of doing cognitive remediation like we do with attention bias training, only with simulation and prospection? I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you.